Welcome to our webinar today. We're excited that you're interested in this uh, uh, great project uh, of the Arnold Foundation grant. Uh, so thank you for your interest. I was asked to give a quick introduction about the COT's approach to fire injury prevention, which is really based uh, in the same way that we would approach any other injury problem. Really for the past 30 to 40 years, the COT has been interested in addressing fire injury prevention, but invariably, it got caught up in an internal discussion and debate about personal liberty. So when we started this, uh, uh, this, this approach about six years ago, uh, we realized this, and so we worked to understand uh, the different uh, uh, philosophies and stories around fire injury and fire injury prevention. Uh, we realized there's two contrasting stories. One we call the fireman freedom narrative, which goes something like this that uh, firearms are critical for personal protection and really an emblem of freedom. The person who holds that view uh, closest to their heart, uh, really you can substitute gun and freedom. The other 40%, 40% uh, of people hold that view. Another 40% uh, roughly hold the view for what we call the firearm and violence narrative, which goes something like this. The wide availability of firearms on our streets and our homes create an increased risk of harm and actually limit personal freedom. Uh, the person who really strongly believes this, this narrative, uh, you can substitute gun and violence. So we decided that we would adhere to three principles. We all agreed that we would address the problem as a medical problem, not a political problem. We would look for evidence-based injury prevention, uh, evidence-based violence prevention programs to implement through our network of trauma centers. And we would make ourselves a forum for civil, collegial, professional dialogue centered on how best to reduce unnecessary death and injury related to firearms. We've learned that it's not only possible to have a common story, but it's, it's actually very doable and it's, it is uh, approaching it in the trauma system way it leads to people actually working together regardless of their views about firearms and freedom. Uh, so we've come to uh, call that the common American narrative, which goes something like this that firearm ownership is a constitutionally protected liberty, but we have a really significant uh, violence problem that leads to hundreds of deaths each day in the US. And we can though make a real dent and reduce that by committing to work together to understand and address the underlying causes of violence, while also working to make firearm ownership as safe as we reasonably can. Our why is really, really important and really big it's to, to reduce those needless deaths and injuries in our patients, in our colleagues, in our communities. We also, though, going through the process, realized that although the why is super important, how really, how really matters. This is a great slide from Kathy Barber. Uh, how really matters. And so our how is to approach it like we would approach any other trauma system problem, which is if we were developing a trauma system anywhere in the world, we would, uh, get folks in a room or in a, a Zoom room, and we would basically be inclusive of all points of view. We'd work to understand how people view the problem, but we would focus a dialogue and try to develop consensus decisions on what's the right thing to do for the patient. Uh, we know that in trauma systems, cooperation and communication save lives, so we work on those things. And then we also know that even though we're making decisions by consensus, we have to have a bias for action, a bias for action that's centered on what's the right thing to do for a patient. So one of the first things that we did was engage firearm owners as part of the solution. Uh, engage the experts in firearm ownership uh, to improve firearm safety. We formed a, a group we call the Firearm Strategy Team. It's a group of firearm owning surgeons and emergency physicians who really committed themselves to come up with recommendations to make firearm ownership as safe as they could while also preserving personal freedom. The second strategy is working to understand and address the root causes of violence. So the second uh, team working on that is our iSAVE team, improving social determinants of health to attenuate violence, working to understand true social determinants of health. And so, so the iSAVE uh, team is working on, on understanding and addressing inequity, injustice, poverty, and poor health outcomes. Anywhere in the world where you find those conditions, I think you'll find hopelessness and structural violence. And so it, their work is critical to get to root causes of violence. 
It's not enough just to put a Band-Aid on the problem. We have to work to understand the root cause. Research is critical to both of those strategies. So we've advocated for funding to match the burden of the disease, both for violence control and firearm safety research. And this graph shows that if funding on the y-axis in a log scale, firearm violence is here. If it was funded commensurate with these other common health problems, that's a billion dollars. So we've got a lot of room to go, but we think we can get there. We think we can make a difference and can uh, greatly improve the uh, research output and expertise around this problem. We know that uh, the medical and professional community agree with this. Dr. Bolger convened a group in February 2019, and that group uh, uh, endorsed this approach, which goes something like this, as you've already heard me say, uh, address the problem as a medical and public health problem. We have to build bridges to do that by committing to work together and work together to understand and uh, reduce violence while making firearm ownership as safe as we can, the common American narrative. And uh, also doing research at a level that matches the burden of the disease. So as I said, we're excited that you're interested in this uh, project. So thank you very much. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you for being interested in learning more about the study. I am Dr. Fred Rafar, Professor of Pediatrics and Epidemiology at the University of Washington, and I work at Harborview Medical Center, the level one trauma center for the state of Washington and the region. You all see firsthand the problem of firearms, but this and the next slide really bring it home. As you can see, there is a marked decrease in the rate of firearm deaths in the United States after the peak in the late 1980s and early 1990s, probably related to the crack cocaine epidemic. Unfortunately, both the number as well as the rate of firearm deaths is once again rising with about 40,000 deaths in 2018, the last year for which CDC has data. This slide makes two points. There has been success in decreasing deaths from motor vehicle crashes over the last four decades due to better, safer vehicles, as well as advances in trauma care. And you also note as well as the fact that there are very good data systems on fatal and non-fatal motor vehicle crashes. The second point is that the U.S. as a whole, there are now more people dying from firearms than from motor vehicle crashes. Even with the uptick in the number of motor vehicle deaths, probably due to distracted driving and cell phones in the last few years. What about non-fatal firearm injuries? <clears throat> the CDC WISCAR systems, which many of us use and know for fatal injuries, uses a sample of 100 emergency departments across the United States that was formed in 1997, and it's well recognized that the data on this for firearm injuries are unreliable. The Healthcare Cost Utilization Project from Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is not provides real-time data. The data are, are delayed by two to three years. The number of fields are limited, and it's based on administrative billing data, so it really um, is limited to what can be used for. The National Violent Death Reporting System only reports on fatal deaths and does not capture any later non-lethal injuries. And these databases do not collect or report any clinical information, such as severity of injuries and their outcomes, nor do they provide data that allows us to contextualize injuries. Last year, there was a report of an expert panel on firearms data, and it concluded that in terms of content, the gaps in knowledge are vast. Few of the key policy questions can be adequately addressed from existing data to inform evidence-based firearms policymaking. So the rationale for this project is shown in this slide. There is no nationwide comprehensive public health data set that provides a robust description of non-lethal firearm injuries, hospitalization characteristics, circumstances leading up to and surrounding the event, risk factors related to the persons involved, and community level factors that predispose to these risks. Hello, uh, I'm Deborah Cools. I'm from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I want to talk to you about next steps. And I'd really like to thank Dr. Rivara for giving us such a thorough and insightful view on the epidemiology of firearm injuries and deaths in the U.S. 
So how will this data be useful to trauma centers like yours? We hope that it will help to inform a public health approach to firearm injury prevention. It'll quantify the number of patients, the injuries, the hospital resources, the disposition or where patients go after they're injured, and um, also the impact that firearm injuries will have on patient and family lives. We also hope that it'll help us and you to better understand the circumstances of firearm injury by intentionality, again, to inform injury prevention. So if we look at unintentional um, injuries, we hope it will give us better insight into safety initiatives that can, again, prevent these injuries that come to us. If we look at intentional self-harm, this always begs, how did this person get access to firearms in order to injure him or herself? So we hope we'll have a better understanding of that. And we, when we look at intentional other harm injuries, it begs, how can we better intervene um, to prevent these injuries that are often violence related. Additionally, it'll help us identify comorbidities, including mental health and other individual risk factors for firearm injuries. And these may also be our standard medical conditions that we may not realize um, factor into firearm injury prevention. We also hope that it will help us identify community risk factors um, and again, opportunities for intervention. Many of you are involved every day in community outreach and by better understanding how our communities and specific communities are at risk for firearm injuries, again, it can help to, um, to inform those activities. And with regards to individuals, we hope that, again, a better understanding of the circumstances and other data that we'll learn from this study will help to prevent the next injury of the patient who is lucky enough to survive a firearm injury. I, again, would really like to thank Dr. Rivara for uh, preparing this nice graph for us. And it's a good reminder that a public health approach has already been used um, to help inform motor vehicle crash um, deaths and injuries and how to decrease them. And it is our hope that we can apply the same informed public health approach to decrease firearm injuries and deaths in the U.S. So this is a brochure that many of you may be familiar with. I've given you the website. It's on the American College of Surgeons um, Injury Prevention website. And um, it is really targeted to how we can really approach our patients on gun safety and, um, and for the, the maintenance of, of health and the avoidance of injury. So again, all of um, the types of injuries uh, that will help to keep us, our loved ones, um, and, and others safe. We hope that all of this will be better informed by the data that we learn uh, from this important initiative. Thank you for your attention. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for your interest in this proposal. What I hope to do over the next several slides is give you a large uh, overview of the study with details coming uh, through the subsequent presentations. First, just to give you a sense of where this came from, the National Collaborative on Gun Violence Research was established somewhere, somewhere around 2018. And it's funded through Arnold Ventures, uh, the Hilton Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, and some other philanthropists with a mission and a focus on really funding and disseminating nonpartisan scientific research that offers uh, policymakers a factual basis for developing fair and effective gun policies, much of what you see in front of you here. Uh, I provided the link to this uh, uh, to their website if you want further information. Uh, there were two RFPs. We were unsuccessful at the, at the first request for proposals, but uh, submitted uh, more recently at the beginning of this year and were successful. The investigators are both uh, myself and Dr. Cools. Uh, who used to uh, uh, head our um, injury prevention subcommittee at the college, 
uh, with co-investigators Dr. Fred Rivera and Dr. Ashley Hink. The study has two large overarching objectives. The first one is to create a national representative data set of non-lethal firearm injuries. Uh, it's predominantly non-lethal firearm injuries. And the reason for that is we know that many firearm deaths occur before patients reach hospital. So as we presented this to the funding agency and knowing the limitation on the lethal firearm injuries, our focus was non-lethal firearm injuries. However, we are still interested in collecting data on the lethal firearm injuries that present to your hospital. And through this objective, what we're gonna essentially do is create a unique platform to understand both individual and community level risk factors around firearm injury. And you'll, you'll see how that plays out over the subsequent slides. Uh, we will also, with this new data set, have an ability to evaluate the association between individual level and community level risk factors and to better understand how these injuries are occurring. When I say uh, the association between individual and community level risk factors, uh, what I mean by that is, is how specific factors at the person level interact with specific factors at the community level to result in the in incidents that we're seeing. This is gonna be a prospective multi-center study involving uh, TQIP centers. And the centers that we're looking for data from are essentially uh, all level ones and twos and threes. Anybody who is interested in participating, uh, we are interested in collecting that data. Uh, what we're gonna be doing is collecting incremental data to what's already being collected through the National Trauma Data Standard. And that incremental data uh, is essentially additional demographic information, additional risk factors, uh, what happened around the injury and early functional outcome information, which really speaks to what the patients looked like as they were leaving hospital. We will not be looking at uh, post-discharge uh, functional outcomes. So to give you more specifics, so aim one is to develop a nationally representative data set of predominantly non-lethal firearm injuries treated at U.S. trauma centers. And uh, I will say this, uh, this study is actually open to Canadian trauma centers as well. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we're not looking just for non-lethal firearm injuries. If a patient dies at your center, uh, they're in scope. And again, this is gonna be incremental data collection uh, with significantly expanded demographics, uh, understanding uh, more specific risk factors, again, precisely uh, the circumstances around the injury, the perpetrator, the type of gun used, uh, and a variety of other aspects uh, around the incident per se. What is gonna be uh, most significantly different is that we're gonna extend data collection to patients who we don't typically collect data on uh, from the TQIP perspective. And this includes patients who are evaluated, treated in the ED, and then discharged home from the ED. So this will be not only incremental data collection in terms of a little bit more data on patients you already collect data on, but a little bit more data on patients who you typically have not yet collected data on. What we'll do is we'll collect these data through a web-based interface and uh, the data will come back to the college and we'll link that to your TQIP data. And that will allow us to have a good sense of, uh, uh, you know, what's happening around the incident and also how this relates to other factors around care, you know, specifically how they're cared for, how these patients are cared for, uh, what injuries they suffer, and all the usual TQIP data that we collect. For those patients who we don't typically collect TQIP data on, that is specifically those patients who are discharged from the ED, we're gonna have a minimal data set uh, that really speaks to uh, only a, a small number of additional fields over and above what's being collected for the purposes of this particular study. Uh, more specifically, we're not gonna be capturing the entire TQIP data set for patients who are being discharged from the ED. There'll be a data dictionary, much like the National Trauma Data Standard, that speaks to uh, what data fields we're collecting and how best to collect the data. And we're gonna have a data validation process so that when the data comes to us, it's as clean as it could be. The second aim is to describe the risk factors for non-lethal firearm injuries, the circumstances and preceding context in which injuries occur, the severity of the injuries, healthcare resource utilization, which is princip principally length of stay, and functional outcomes at discharge. And we want to be able to explore these factors 
to determine how they differ based on the intent of injury. So was it an accidental uh, uh, firearm injury? Was it intentional? Uh, what were the factors that led to it and how that might relate to some of these other outcomes? We'll look at this as a function of intent, as I mentioned, as age, as well as urbanicity. We wanna be able to understand how urban firearm injuries differ from rural firearm injuries, which is why it's so important to get a large uh, sample of trauma centers participating. We'll also try to get a good sense of how the, um, uh, uh, the victim characteristics, the risk factors and the circumstances around the injury uh, differ between uh, those that result in death and those that don't. Our third aim is to explore the association between the circumstances and context of injury with individual and community level risk factors to identify potential modifiable factors for targeted interventions. So what does that mean? Well, you're gonna give us all the patient level information. Uh, we need to have a better understanding of what the community looks like. And what we're gonna be doing to do that is you'll be sending us zip code information as you typically do now for patients who you enter into um, uh, your registry. And we'll be able to link that zip code to a number of community level indices that give us a sense of um, you know, socioeconomic status, employment status, uh, whether there are gaps with respect to education, um, other social supports and so on. There's a number of different indices out there that if we have the patient zip code, we can well characterize that community. And I mentioned three indices here, the area deprivation index, uh, the unmet needs score, which really speaks to gaps in, uh, in community support and what's called the community need index. That will allow us to understand really the context of injury from the community perspective. And ultimately we'll be able to figure out how uh, factors at the person level or the patient level interact with community level factors to result in the injuries that we're seeing. It'll also help us understand the social determinants of health and the disparities across communities. It, I think, will also give us the ability to understand how uh, certain communities, despite uh, looking like they're quite challenged with respect to deprivation or unmet needs, actually have very low rates of firearm injuries. They're probably doing something different that we would like to learn more about so we can focus on what might be excellent interventions to prevent firearm injuries. Lastly, we're gonna to try to develop national estimates of the annual incidence of non-lethal firearm injuries across the United States. So we've, we're gonna be partnering with the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation to develop estimates and quantify the national and they think they can probably work on global uh, burden of disease for firearm injuries. Uh, this is a, um, a, a group that has unbelievable technical skills and they've been very effective at uh, estimating risks and uh, where we, we will be going with the uh, COVID pandemic. And they're gonna use that same skill set to understand uh, the global burden and certainly national burden of firearm injuries. And that is uh, all for what I have to say in terms of presenting an overview of this study. Again, there'll be additional information on the subsequent uh, slides and presentations. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christopher Haft and I'm the manager of data and report operations at the ACS Trauma Quality Programs. In this segment, I'll be covering a bit about the data that we'll be collecting as a part of this grant, as well as the way that we'll be collecting those data. The first question you might have is which patients will require additional data collection? So for the purposes of this grant, we'll be collecting data on all firearm injury patients. So these are patients qualifying for the NTDS via our NTDS inclusion criteria, and also patients treated and discharged from the ED. These are patients that don't typically meet NTDS inclusion criteria, and so we'll cover the data collection mechanism for them a little bit later on. And this is any firearm injury, whether the primary mechanism or otherwise. And this is gonna be for admissions starting in early 2021 and continuing for up to 12 months with the specific initial date of collection, TBD, but release soon. So what additional data will be collected? So for the purposes of this grant, we are leveraging the NTDS as much as possible. So all those data elements you currently submit to us as a part of your participation in TQIP and that we use for your benchmark reports, we're leveraging those data as much as possible and they will be important to the research goals of the grant. 
However, there are some additional data elements we need to collect because there's information we need that's either totally new, not captured in any way, shape, or form in NTDS data elements, or there's information we need in a new format, so potentially more detailed than we have in the NTDS because the content is so important for this grant. These new data elements will be structured like NTDS elements, including the validation rules that you see on regular NTDS elements, and we'll provide additional information and a data source hierarchy guide as we would in regular NTDS data elements. So the structure will be very familiar with what you're used to from your participation with TQIP. Ultimately, this will amount in 21 to 30 additional data elements with the range reflecting different patient scenarios. So depending on how you respond to some values, you may have follow-up questions, and that's what creates that range. And these are going to be the NCGVR specific data elements for firearm injury patients. We will provide the NCGVR data dictionary uh, prior to your enrollment in the grant, so you'll have a chance to review those data elements and their definitions before you decide whether or not this is something that your facility can participate in. So, while you will have an opportunity to review that dictionary soon, I'm going to cover a bit about the sort of overall structure and design so you have a, a bit of a baseline before you see that document. So we'll be collecting data across four domains. And again, these are data elements in addition to what you already submit for the NTDS. So the domains are demographics, risk factors, circumstances of injury, and early functional status and or healthcare needs at discharge. So let's look into those each, let's look into each domain specifically. So for demographics, we'll collect information on employment status, patient caregivers for those aged 18 and younger, and military status. Let's dig a little deeper on employment status. As you can see, the element is structured similar to an NTDS data definition. There's a text description, there's element values, additional information that help you code patients into this data element, and then a data source hierarchy guide. So the same information will be provided for all the data elements we'll discuss from here on. The next domain is risk factors. So the elements in that domain are ETOH, use, preceding injury, mental illness and type, cognitive disorders, arrest and or incarceration, prior violent assaults or injuries and type, prior suicide attempt, threat or self-harm and type, adverse experiences and or exposures and type, as well as firearm ownership and access and type. And again, let's look at one of these a little more in detail, adverse experiences and or exposures. So for this data element, you'll get the text definition, the element values, and especially for elements like this where we're expecting you to code a narrative situation into these large element values, we'll provide definitions so that you have uh, enough detail to know um, what element value is appropriate for each patient. The next domain is circumstances of injury. For that, we'll be collecting intent, setting, relationship to shooter, type of firearm used. For self-inflicted and unintentional intents, we'll collect owner of firearm used and firearm storage. We'll also collect context of injury, and that'll be categorized by intent. So an intent of assault will have a different follow-up data element than an intent of self-harm. And we'll also have context of injury description. So that's a narrative data element describing the full circumstances of a context of injury. The last domain is early functional status and or healthcare needs at discharge. For those data elements, it'll be functional status, rehabilitation, post-discharge needs, home health needs, and psychosocial ancillary services. So while you'll have a chance to review the data dictionary and learn more about each of those data elements in detail, I wanna cover a few notable features that are things that we wanna highlight as we believe they'll be the most important for you to consider when thinking about your capacity to participate in this grant project. So you'll notice that one element, one element we collect is a narrative element. That'll be the first of its kind for something that we're facilitating the collection for. And what we want to note is that you'll have to be um, careful about not submitting identifying information. So if you participate in this grant and you're submitting this narrative, we need to make sure you're not submitting patient name or social security number or any amount of information that is not covered by our agreements. Um, so it's just a, a new thing that we'll all have to be careful for with this grant. In other circumstances, there will be narratives that are abstracted in the response value. So you may have a long text description that you're available, that you have access to in the medical records, and we'll be asking you to categorize those in a, a number of data elements. 
They will also require obtaining more information from a patient or obtaining information from other data sources not commonly accessed. So we know that a lot of the data elements that are specific to this grant might not be something that you currently have in your registry and that may require you um, finding access to the data that's required in, in different ways than you currently do with your registry. So that's something you'll have to pay attention to and think about when you evaluate this dictionary is how you'd be able to obtain the information that we're looking for in the grant. Some of you may have noticed that there are some dedicated elements that are otherwise captured by ICE-10 external, external cause codes, namely intent and setting, but we've decided to collect those as dedicated elements due to the importance and specificity. So we really want to make sure we get very accurate and specific information about those um, features as they're very important for the grant. And you'll also notice there are similarities with NTDS elements. So I give one example on the screen, um, but there are some other data elements where the divergence between, between something we collect in NTDS and what we collect in NCGVR is slight, uh, but we'll need you to pay attention so that you're really uh, coding things accurately in those sort of two different mechanisms. So another important part of this grant is that we will be linking your NTDS data with your NCGVR data, as well as um, other community level data sets. And to do that, there's a couple of things that we need you to focus on, especially if you participate in this grant. One is that the patient IDs must match between what you submit via NTDS and what you submit through the NCGVR data module. So um, the only way we'll be able to link your NTDS data with your NCGVR data is if you give us a patient ID that actually matches between those two systems. So it'll be really important that you know exactly what you're submitting in the NTDS so you can match that in the NCGVR data submission. Additionally, those community level data sets, many of them are most useful at a nine digit zip code because they contain very specific information. So for instance, in home zip on patients that are firearm injury patients, we ask that you try as much as possible to submit that nine digit zip code as is allowed by the NTDS, but becomes especially important when we're trying to link these data uh, for the rest of this grant project. So these are just some things that need to be considered um, when you're discussing your options for how you can participate. As I mentioned previously, we will be collecting data on fire injury patients that are treated and discharged from the ED. So these are patients that wouldn't conventionally meet NTDS inclusion criteria. And as such, we won't be receiving NTDS elements on those patients. So in addition to the NCGVR data elements, we'll ask that you also report um, a subset of NTDS elements that are detailed on the screen. And we'll, we'll make uh, the collection of those data available through the mechanism we'll discuss shortly here. But it's just one thing to note that for those non-NTDS patients that are firearm injury patients, we will still need to collect them through this mechanism and collect some NTDS elements on them. So the next question you might have is how will these data be collected and reported? Well, for your NTDS data elements, that's going to be via the existing process. So the same way you've always submitted your NTDS data to us um, and that we use for your benchmark reports and another number of other uh, services we provide. So that NTDS process is unchanged. For the NCGVR data, that'll be collected via a web-based direct data entry platform provided by the ACS and integrated with the TQP data center. So in short, we will be providing you the tool by which you'll submit those additional data elements that I covered previously. The data will be entered in the platform at discharge, and then we will link with NTDS data once submitted. So you don't have to change your NTDS data submission process, you'll still submit quarterly, and then once we get those data from NTDS, we, the ACS, in the back end will do the linkage with the data you submitted for the NCGVR data elements. So as I mentioned before, data collection will be integrated with the TQP data center. So this is the website that many of you are familiar with for submitting your data to us and viewing your reports, and we will leverage that existing technology. It'll be a separate tab that you access when you log into the page. This is a sample form, so this is not data that we're collecting specifically for this grant, but this shows you what the data collection mechanism will look like. So there will be, you know, um, tabs that have different uh, subsections of data. You'll enter those data, there'll be inline validation, and then you'll be able to save the record and submit to us all from the tool itself. 
So some highlights of this data collection platform, it is web-based and secure. Because it's on the TQP data center, it's using the same site that you already submit data to us. So hopefully that will help with some of the data security concerns that an institution might have. We're, we're really leveraging that same infrastructure. There's no changes to the NTDS process, no additional burden of work from registry products. So because we're using the regular NTDS data and NCGVR data collected through our own mechanism, you don't have to work with your vendor to have anything change in your products. You should be able to use regular NTDS and the data collection platform that we're providing. There is no additional cost for access. So if you are participating in the grant, you have access to this data collection tool free of charge. There is no data import function, so the data must be entered manually. Um, so that's just another thing to consider when you're um, evaluating your ability to participate. You will have access to your data in the platform for the duration of the grant. So all the patient level data you have, you'll be able to see it in the tool and export it. Um, and so that will be available as a resource for you. And then also just it's going to be important that for the purposes of um, data linkage, even though these data aren't being collected specifically through this NCGVR platform, you have to really focus on making sure that your nine digit zip and patient IDs are um, as accurate as possible as they'll be most important for data linkage. So in summary, uh, participation in the NCGVR grant will mean that you'll be collecting an additional 21 to 30 data elements on all firearm injury patients, starting with admissions in early 2021 and continuing for up to 12 months with the specific start date to be, de uh, to be decided soon. You'll also be collecting about 30 NTDS elements on patients that are treated and discharged from the ED, and all data will be collected and reported using a web-based direct data entry platform provided without cost by the ACS. And then the ACS will link the data that you're submitting through that platform with the regular NTDS data that you already submit to us. And as such, we'll obtain all the data we need to um, make this grant possible. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Ashley Hink, one of the co-investigators on this study and a trauma surgeon at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. Thank you for your consideration and participating in this fantastic study. I think one of the things that's very important to point out that outside of the large scope of this project in which we'll be collecting aggregated data from centers and analyzing it at the national level is that the data that you collect has the potential to be utilized not only for your research but for population needs assessment. There will be very robust descriptive data that you collect on your patient population in addition to the variables that we collect for TQIP. There's an ability to think outside the box and outside of the scope of what we're doing to use your data and some of our aggregated data to better inform uh, understanding on epidemiology and the burden of non-fatal firearm injuries, both in your community and maybe in your state or region. There might be the ability to do comparative analysis to other injured patient populations, such as those who experience motor vehicle collisions or falls, an ability to do really in-depth subgroup analysis informed geospatial analysis of your community and where the injuries that you're treating are coming from and creating heat maps that overlie community and individual level risk factors. There might be an opportunity to do health services research and use this data that you collect to analyze costs, readmissions, and other things that might inform health services and utilization of resources. If you're actually implementing any interventions or assessing community changes or policy changes, there might be an opportunity for some pre and post analysis for the data that you're collecting at your institution, and perhaps the ability to study some long-term outcomes on the patients that you collect data from. And so this is just food for thought about further research opportunities and questions to think about, about what you can actually do with this data that you collect at your own center outside of the scope of what we're doing. And just as an example, there's some great opportunities out there for geospatial analysis. We're going to be assessing very in-depth risk factors, both at the individual level and the community level, for where these injuries take place. This is a great example of a heat map created in a Journal of Trauma article in 2018, understanding some of the community level risk factors of where these injuries take place. We're going to be collecting a number of indices that assess community level risk factors, such as the area deprivation index that will be linked to where these injuries occur so that you can better understand what's happening in your community and what these risk factors are and how you might tailor community level interventions for them. There's also a benefit of 
really truly understanding your patient population that experiences firearm injuries that can inform opportunities for prevention and intervention efforts in addition to how you can support your own patients that experience firearm injuries. We're going to be assessing the common risk factors at the individual and the community level, what some of the circumstances are, where these injuries are occurring in the communities, and what you can might do is then ask yourself, okay, well, what's needed to maybe prevent some of these? Are most of your injuries secondary to community violence? Do you have a high rate of intimate partner violence? What are some of the risk factors that that individual or those individuals are experiencing that could be intervened on as you're developing and thinking about opportunities for prevention? An important strategy that is adopted and uh, really reinforced as an opportunity to prevent and improve outcomes for violence are hospital and community violence intervention programs. A core opportunity and factor for these is that you have to understand your population in order to understand what kinds of services you need. And this might actually be an opportunity for you to do that in addition to informing some of the community needs for social determinants of health. One of the things that you might be asking is, okay, well, how, how much is this data actually available in our electronic medical records for our patients that experience gunshot wounds? I did a pilot study utilizing data at Harborview Medical Center that really asked, my, asked myself these things to understand what do we really know about our patients that can help inform these things. And what I found is that a lot of these data elements were actually available 75% of the time for individuals who experience gunshot wounds on assessment of 60 cases. And here's an example of what I learned about my patient population that might inform uh, what we would do there. And you would have the ability to understand your patient population and how it can inform prevention and intervention efforts. So for our assault related injuries, I found that about a third were related to community violence, which might be very different than other urban areas. Uh, a fair number were secondary to interpersonal conflict and intimate partner violence. And what we found is that a lot were occurring in public settings. Uh, we were not frequently assessing if these individuals who are victimized have firearms, which is obviously an opportunity for improvement and potential education for these individuals. We found that over a third had a mental illness, almost half had a history of substance abuse, and about half had a history of assault. By understanding my patients there, this can significantly inform what their needs are, what might enhance their uh, recovery, um, and then also how we might prevent some of these um, poor outcomes and the experience of violence, especially knowing how many of them have a history of violent injury and interact with the healthcare system. And so I think this is a great example of how you might use this data at your own center. And I think it's important to know that this data tells a really in-depth story. Just as an example, I was able to find out about a patient who was 59 years old who experienced an intimate partner violence related assault, um, that she had significant risk factors, history of IPV, prior suicidal threats, and had a firearm in the home. I was able to understand the details of the incident, that she was shot during an argument by a handgun that was owned by her husband, and I was able to understand what we actually did for her and what some of her outcomes were. We won't be assessing some of those things in this project, but this is just an example of what you have the potential to learn about your patients by collecting these additional data elements. An additional benefit of participation is that you might have the ability to link some of your own center's data to other data sets. One of the major deficits, which we've already talked about in current firearm injury data, is that a lot of the data doesn't talk. Criminal justice, public health, and clinical data is not linked at a national level. We won't be doing that at the national level either. However, you will have the ability to potentially aggregate your center data with perhaps your local police data or coroner's data to provide a better or complete understanding of the burden of firearm injuries and deaths in your community. Perhaps you can assess criminal justice outcomes of the patients that you treat uh, and maybe better learn some of the data regarding the actual firearm that was used. Where did it come from? What was the legality of it? Who owned it? Some of that data is available in local police data. And you might think about how you can design some research opportunities to use your data and aggregate it with other local data to improve some of these gaps. And last, I wanna really highlight the fact that by participating, this is a significant contribution to improving the understanding and the burden of risk of non-fatal firearm injuries in the US. This is going to help improve and significantly fill gaps in our understanding of the details of our patients 
their risk factors, and the circumstances of specifically non-fatal firearm injuries. And we'll use this data to generate some national uh, estimates of non-fatal firearm injury, both of, again of which is a huge deficit. And why us? We've really, I think, stepped up to the plate in recognizing that us as trauma surgeons and trauma centers have uh, an opportunity and an obligation to fulfill and better understanding uh, some of the data surrounding this. We're their caregivers. We have access to very detailed information, as I've shown you with some of my pilot data. We treat about 70% of GSWs in, US, in the U.S., so we not only learn a lot about our patients, but we treat the majority of them. We have the ability to capture understudied communities and patients. We really want to include trauma centers at multiple levels and across the country to better understand what's happening in both rural and urban areas and to really get a good picture nationally. And we really want to advance the science of uh, better understanding gunshot wounds in our patients and really informing prevention opportunities and ways that we can improve recovery. So thank you for your consideration. And um, again, I think there's a lot of really fantastic opportunities both nationally and for your own center to use this data. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tamara Kaczynski. I am staff at the American College of Surgeons that will be helping support the administrative side of this research study. I will be reviewing a few important next steps to confirm your center's participation in the study. First, at your center, please be sure to obtain the necessary approval from your leadership to participate. Identify someone to serve as the lead endpoint person for the study at your center. They would be the designated person for any of your administrative needs and the main contact for us throughout the duration of your study participation. Share information on the study with all staff involved. Please make sure they have reviewed this particular webinar and all upcoming additional resources that we share with you. Please also check your center's IRB requirements for participating in this type of research. With the TQIP COT team, please confirm your study participation by completing the survey form I have linked on the next slide. Please also be sure to participate in all additional data collection trainings offered by TQIP for the study. Once you obtain all of the necessary approvals at your center, please confirm your commitment to participate in this study by completing the linked survey form shown here. We will be considering the centers collected here as our final list of participants. Please do not email with an expectation that you will be added to the list. Please also check your center's specific requirements for participating in any sort of research. Our study funder requires the ACS COT to apply for IRB approval. We're using a central IRB system, which will supplement the existing BAA DUAs that we have in place with each of your centers. Some important uh, things to keep in mind. Uh, please confirm your participation by Monday, November 16th. Please confirm your participation by completing the survey monkey form shown here. If you have any additional questions that were not answered by listening to this webinar, please email at traumaquality at facs.org. Thank you.